We'll be discussing the new analyses performed here at Yale, not only on the Vinland map, but also on the manuscripts with which it is associated. The Vinland map has been hailed as the earliest depiction of America's coast supposedly drawn over 50 years before Columbus's famous voyage. Using the analytical methods available to scientists over the last seven decades, there have been numerous attempts to discover its age and authenticity. It's interesting that the Vinland map is rarely mentioned in context with the objects most closely related to it, the texts it was once part of. These three items have an intertwined history but have never been systematically examined together and never before at Yale. Now, conservators at Yale University Library have been able to work with scientists from Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, using new methods to examine them and find new information. Oops, let's go back one. By amazing coincidence, these two seemingly unrelated volumes arrived in New Haven, Connecticut at exactly the same time. Both volumes and map reside at Yale's Beinecke Library. This is Vincent de Beauvais' 15th century Speculum Historiale and the separately bound single section of de Britia's Historia Tartarorum, known as the Tartar Relation. The Vinland map was found at the front of the Tartar Relation when the two volumes arrived at Yale. The map was removed at some point in the 70s or 80s. And the map itself showing Vinlanda Insula puzzling inscription that will be addressed later, and the important wormholes. This simple stack of paper choirs or sections will help us visualize the choir diagram of the manuscripts to show how they fit together. The diagram shows the folios of all three manuscripts. On the left, the single folio of the map in blue is shown along with the single parchment and paper choir of the Tartar Relation. There are 15 choirs in the speculum on the right, and each, like the Tartar Relation, is made from an outer folio of parchment, six paper folios, and an inner folio of parchment. Doctors Fittiment and Teasdale at Cambridge University performed peptide mass fingerprinting using eraser chrome samples taken from each of these parchment folios to determine the species of animal used to make them. It was hoped the information may help indicate the geographical location where the manuscript was made, but it turns out the speculum contains both calf and goat skins, and both types of animals were available in most parts of Europe in the Middle Ages. So the red lines indicate goat parchment, goat parchment and the blue calf parchment. The DNA of the samples was also analyzed, and from the results, Dr. Dr. Teasdale said that the DNA evidence indicates both halves of the Vinland map are likely from a single animal um, as both the DNA genome and the sex of the animal seem to be the same. Uh, we also did carbon-14 dating. It was carried out first in 2002 and additional uh, radiocarbon dating was done in 2018 with samples taken from two parchment and two paper leaves in the manuscripts as well as the left half of the map. The results all indicate that the material they were written on dates from approximately 1400 to 1460, uh, right about when the manuscript was written. So the Speculum Historiale is a fairly common book in the medieval library and encyclopedia in a number of volumes. The Yale Speculum isn't unusual at first, but like many old books, there are new repairs and end sheets, new sewing and end bands, you can clearly see offset writing on the boards, which was left behind when earlier paste down sheets were removed and their ink stuck in the glue. Those paste downs had been made from a document dating to 1437, which is still readable in reverse. The volume was said to have been written sometime during the Council of Basel between 1431 and 39. When the volume arrived at Yale in 1957, these boards were used as sure proof of the date the text was written. However, using reflectance transformance imaging on the first opening, it's clearly shown that the hardware on the boards and the deep indentations visible in the first page do not coincide. Combined with the fact that the attachments and the sewing are new, 
uh, this can only mean that these boards were not originally part of this book. They were added later. So they can't really be used to date the writing or the book. Not only the binding was altered, but the text as well. This close up shows the pinkish remains of an ownership stamp, which was excised from the foot of a page. You can see the serrated edge of the replacement parchment against the writing in the left-hand image. Why was it important to hide the identity of this relatively unspectacular volume of a common medieval encyclopedia? The Tartar Relation. What do we know about the Tartar Relation? Well, it's essentially a short travelogue of a trip to the lands of Genghis Khan, written by a religious brother known as C. Debridia in the 13th century. Until recently, Yale's copy was considered the only known copy of this text and was acquired in its current form, this slim modern bound volume. Originally, we know its single section was bound in at the end of the text of the Speculum Historiale. The handwritten text is very close in appearance to that of the Speculum, and it's assumed to have been written by the same scribe at the same time. When another copy of the speculum was found in Lucerne recently, it also had a copy of the Tartar relation bound in at the back of it, which helps establish precedence for the practice, at least for these two volumes. In 2013, John Paul Floyd, a Scottish historian, discovered an exhibition catalog from the 1893 Columbian exhibition in Madrid. The catalog includes mention of a 15th century manuscript volume containing books 21 to 24 of the Speculum Historiale, followed by C. Debridia's Historia Tartarorum. This was among many items contributed for display by the Archdiocese of Zaragoza. Spanish priest and scholar Cristobal Perez Pastor reported seeing the same codex in the exhibition. Neither the catalog entry nor Perez Pastor's description mentions the presence of a map in this volume. Sometime around the Second World War, an Italian book dealer named Enzo Ferraioli, working in Zaragoza, was known to have obtained many ancient books and manuscripts under suspicious circumstances. This includes a copy of the Speculum with the Tartar Relation that later waited, made its way to Yale. Ferrioli was convicted of theft and imprisoned briefly, but always maintained his innocence and was released. It is likely that during Ferrioli's ownership uh, that the Tartar relation was removed from the binding, the Speculum Historiale was rebound, the owner stamps removed, and the Vinland map made its appearance. On the left is an early 80s diagram of the Tartar relation's choir structure. Uh, made while it was at Yale. You can see a single section with two vellum folios at the front of the text and one at the back. One of those folios at the front is the Vinland map. It may be worth noting that the collation of the speculum on the right shows a missing parchment leaf, the dotted line, at the beginning of the first choir and a stub, which may indicate at least one other leaf was removed. We also know that another full folio was removed from the beginning of the text as the matching wormholes prove. And this was the likely source of parchment used to make the Vinland map. The Vinland map itself is entirely underwhelming. It has a shiny bleached appearance, quite different visually from the, the other parchment present in the manuscripts. It's written in ink on very thin parchment. Uh, the map as noted earlier was bound at the front of the Tartar relation text. When Enzo Ferraioli mentioned before, and a British bookseller named Davis tried to sell the Tartar relation to the British Museum, they were turned down because the curator felt the map was suspicious. Sometime later, American bookseller Lawrence Witten from New Haven met Ferraioli in Spain and obtained the Tartar relation from an unnamed, unnamed acquaintance of his. Witten returned to New Haven with the volume and gave it to his wife. Interest, inter, uh, interestingly, the volume of the Speculum Historiale appeared in New Haven at the same time, sold by Davis to Thomas Marston. Marston was head of the rare books department at Yale, and that's where the Yale story begins. This image is of the map in raking light, so it's a little more interesting this way. 
it is cockled and distorted and its two halves are held together with a strip of paper. Um, it seems to have had a hard life. In transmitted life, uh, you can see the wormholes and the patches on the verso of the map. And the strip, no, oh, not in this one. Oh, there's the patches. There, and there's the strip that joins the two parts, uh, the two halves of the map together. There's an abrasion on the left and one of the squares covers a flaw, not a wormhole. The wormholes are important. This slide shows their location in the map. Wormholes that correspond between the map and the speculum text were discovered when Lawrence Witten and Thomas Marston, who are old friends, compared their new books. Witten had rather cleverly noted that the books were of similar size and had similar Gothic strip, uh, script. Lo and behold, there were wormholes in each of the books. And as this animation shows, they match. This animation shows the correspondence of the holes in the map on the right to the holes in the first folio of the Speculum Historiale on the left. As you can see, wormhole placement does indicate that the parchment on which the Vinland map was drawn had to have originally been at the beginning of the text of the Speculum Historiale, not at the beginning of the text of the Tartar Relation where the map was found. The wormholes have been cited as the definitive proof that the Vinland map is an authentic 15th century work. However, this only shows that the parchment is 15th century and it doesn't say anything about the inks used to make the map. As mentioned, it was at some point between the Colombian exhibition in 1893 in Madrid and 1957 when the map arrived at Yale that the one volume became two volumes. The story of the Vinland map is tied up in these separate but related objects. It is for this reason that the three items have been examined together in these recent analyses. The materials used to create them should tell the same story. So we, we've just looked at the parchment and paper on which the map was drawn and the manuscripts written. Is there something we can learn by examining the writing and the inks? The script of the Speculum Historiale on the left and the Tartar Relation on the right, which were likely written by the same scribe, show similarities in their style and their inks. The writing is Gothic in style and has the appearance of a typical Irongal ink. The ink and writing on the Vinland map, on the other hand, look different. Let's now look more closely at the inks used in the creation of the Vinland map in associated manuscripts and at the results of the scientific analysis the Yale team carried out. But before we dive into the uh, details of the analysis, it's important to understand the limitations of scientific examination of cultural heritage objects. We cannot prove something is genuine using an analytical tools. However, we can show if the materials and techniques used to create a manuscript, a painting, or a map are in line with the materials and techniques available for the time and place the artifact was supposedly made. Multiple groups have examined the Vinland map for over 50 years but our work represents the first extensive analysis done by Yale personnel and benefits from the most recent technology. X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy or XRF is a technique that identifies many of the elements present in an object. The capability to make measurements at a single point has been available for decades, but it's only relatively recently that XRF scanning allows flat objects to be imaged. The elemental maps that are generated allow one to visualize a distribution of elements in an area of interest. This, this approach does not require a sample to be taken and is therefore considered a highly useful non-destructive technique. A colleague and I are here, uh, are pictured here positioning the villain map for scanning. In this slide, we can see an image of the villain map in the top left corner along with three false color elemental uh, maps generated by X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. In these images, areas that are lighter or brighter in color indicate um, uh, increased levels of an element, while the, the, while the darker or black areas indicate a lower concentration or the absence of that element. In the elemental map of iron, we can see red areas on the left-hand side of the map near an abraded portion of the parchment. 
along the, and along the vertical fold at the center of the map where there's a paper repair and small square areas corresponding to the parchment repairs. Most European medieval manuscripts were written using Arangal ink, which is made from iron sulfate, known as green vitriol, powdered gall nuts, and a binder such as gum arabic. If the map had been drawn with Arangal ink, we should have been able to see the delineation of the map against a darker background in both the iron and the sulfur images, and perhaps in the copper map, if the vitriol used contained copper sulfate impurities. We are uncertain as to the source of the iron in certain areas, but it obviously does not correspond to the text or map outline. Previous studies of the villain map involving analysis of over 100 individual points suggested that titanium was present in the inclines and not generally on the parchment. Our recent XRF scanning analysis confirms the presence of titanium in the ink used to draw the map and write its text and allows for the first time visualization of the distribution of titanium over the entirety of the map. The titanium element map you see here clearly shows the areas where the element is present. The higher the concentration, the brighter the line. The highlighted area is labeled Finlanda Insula, the portion of the map meant to correspond to the northeastern part of the North American coastline. An XRF scan of this part of the map reveals the high level of titanium as well as lesser amounts of barium. The presence of barium is significant because the earliest commercially produced titanium white pigments contained both titanium dioxide and barium sulfate. X-ray diffraction and analysis combined with scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy of a, of a 1923 sample of titanium dioxide manufactured in Norway confirmed the presence of barium sulfate. The iron map of the same area shows that iron is somewhat randomly scattered on the parchment and clearly not along the map lines or the portion of an inscription that is visible in the upper right of the upper right of the image. Multispectral imaging can be used to visualize a spectral response of ink to different wavelengths of light. When this approach was used to examine the Tartar relation, we discovered an altered passage of text on the first page of the manuscript. The highlighted section of text does not appear unusual with visible and ultraviolet illumination, but under infrared light, small sections of text appear to be different from the surrounding letters or words. The ink used to write this text is darker, but responds similarly to the, uh, to the ink used in the villain map. Its behavior is consistent with a carbon-containing ink, and the presence of carbon was later confirmed with using Raman spectroscopy. In these elemental maps of the area of the Tartar Relations Altered Passage, we can clearly see that the ink used to write the rest of the manuscript contains iron, sulfur, and copper, markers of a typical iron gall ink with copper impurities. The somewhat confusing appearance of the iron and copper maps is due to the fact that the XRF technique picks up the writing on the recto and verso of the, of the page. This effect is not as evident in the sulfur map because sulfur, a lighter element, emits lower energy X-rays than the heavier iron and copper. Notice in the sulfur map two areas in the fourth and fifth lines of the text where there are gaps. These spaces correspond to the areas of the text that were altered and rewritten with a different kind of ink. Our decision to scan this particular area of the page was guided by the infrared imaging done in the early stages of the Finland map project. To further explore this discovery, we utilized a different instrument to obtain high resolution XRF images of portions of the altered text pa passage. You can see in the top left, visible light images of the recto and verso of a portion of the altered text. The element maps show that the ink used to write this passage has the same constituents as the Finland map ink, as evidenced by the presence of titanium and barium. The iron and copper maps correspond to the iron gall ink writing on the verso of the page. The potassium and sulfur maps are less clear because those elements seem to be associated not only with the new titanium containing ink, but possibly with the residue of other letters that once occupied the space on the recto of the page.
Another important discovery we made with the use of XRF scanning is that the inscription on the verso of the map includes two types of ink. The passage in Latin on the right, which translates as second part of the third part of the speculum, was written with an iron gall ink, as the iron, copper, and sulfur maps demonstrate. This passage could refer to a bookbinder's note about how to assemble the speculum historiali, which is a massive work made up of 32 books or sections, usually bound in four volumes. A second titanium containing ink was used to overwrite the original passage and add additional words. This new text, which roughly translates in very tortured prose as drawing first part, second part of the third part of the speculum, appears to attempt to connect the map with the Speculum Historiali, a document whose medieval origin is unquestioned. An iron gall ink inscription at the end of the speculum indicates that the last page corresponds to the end of the third part of the speculum. Yale's copy of the speculum consists of books 21 to 24, which is indeed the second part or half of the third part of the speculum. XRF can tell us that titanium is present on the map, but it cannot identify the specific titanium containing component of the ink. Raman microscopy, a form of molecular spectroscopy, can tell us what compounds are present in the ink. In a previous study, Raman spectra were acquired at only nine points on the Vinland map, and the titanium species was identified as anatase, one of three natural forms of titanium dioxide. Spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy was also used to identify the dark ink component simply as carbon or soot. Like XRF scanning, the Raman microscope can be used to obtain maps showing distribution of materials. For example, a Raman map of this small Greek isle was acquired that included 2,300 spectra. The heat map you see on the right clearly shows for the first time how the anatase correlates with the ink line. Similar Raman maps and multiple point measurements were obtained in other locations to confirm that anatase is indeed broadly distributed in the ink on the Vinland map. No evidence was seen of rutile or brookite, the other naturally occurring titanium dioxide mineral forms. Various processes have been used for commercial production of titanium dioxide with a product containing anatase being available beginning in the 1920s, followed by manufacture of a rutile form in the late 1930s. The evidence just presented reinforces what previous researchers had found and firmly establishes that the ink on the recto and verso of the map, as well as a single location on the tartar relation, contain titanium, and that this is in the form of anatase. But what does it tell us about when the ink was applied to the parchment? and whether it is consistent with a medieval origin. Could the anatase be from a natural source? Is the ink merely unique rather than suspect? Previous work had shown that the size and shape of the anatase particles match that of commercially produced material. In order to explore the answer to these questions, we needed to take tiny samples of the ink and image them using scanning electron microscopy. Multiple ink samples were obtained on the Vinland map and the Tartar relation, but there's only time to show a few examples. To correlate with the XRF scanning analysis presented earlier, one of the samples was taken from the titanium rich southern coast of Vinlanda Insula on the recto of the map. A high magnification image of the minuscule ink fragments and the corresponding elemental analysis is shown here. The upper left image shows a literal field of titanium with several larger particles of barite or barium sulfate highlighted in the red circles as evidenced on the barium and sulfur maps. A side-by-side -side comparison at a magnification of 50,000 of a sample of anatase commercially produced in 1923 and a sample from Vinlanda Insula illustrates the striking similarity of the two sets of particles. The rhomboid shape of manufactured titanium dioxide is visible in both photomicrographs, confirming that the anatase in the Vinland map is of modern origin. 
As has already been mentioned, white pigments containing titanium dioxide in the form of anatase were only available commercially starting around 1920. Since the Vinland map for surfaces in 1957, our evidence supports the assertion that other investigators have made that it was created at some point between the 1920s and the mid 1950s. The presence of barium sulfate in the anatase may mean that at least some of an earlier form of commercially available titanium white was used to prepare the ink. It has been suggested that the titanium on the map is attributable to the presence of anatase in naturally occurring titanium rich clays but we did not find evidence of the aluminosilicates that would be associated with a clay source. Likewise, the naturally occurring mineral form of anatase is relatively rare, and there is no evidence of its use as a pigment. Finally, taken in conjunction with the XRF scanning results shown earlier, we present additional evidence that speaks to the question of whether the Vinland map is a fake, an innocent 20th century creation that was later ascribed to a 15th century source or an intentional attempt to deceive. Four locations were sampled on the verso inscription of the map. But again, time only permits us to look at a single titanium rich area. The highlighted uh, image contained particles with the same rhomboid shape seen on the recto of the map and the altered text passage in the Tartar relation. These particles are clearly embedded in the ink and not merely clinging to the surface. Our work on the Vinland map, the Speculum Historiale, and the Tartar relation has confirmed and extended the research on the materiality of these objects that was carried out over the past half century. Our findings support and complement the historical record and the recent evidence unearthed by John Paul Floyd. The evidence all points to the fact that the map was drawn by an unknown person in the early to mid 1950s on a piece of 15th century parchment, which once served as an end paper in the front of the Speculum Historiale, using a very unusual ink containing carbon and titanium dioxide of modern origin. The map is therefore certainly a fake and most likely a forgery. Apparently, you can tell a manuscript by its ink. We would like to gratefully acknowledge the hard work that has been done on this project and the many contributions of our colleagues near and far, especially Team Titanium at Yale. Thank you very much.